investment in security and defense at the confluence of the EU strategic compass and the NATO strategic concept, a panel prepared in cooperation with the Integrated Intelligence, Defense and Security Solutions Association. The panel is moderated by Mr. Nikolai Yanku, president of the I2DS2. Nikolai Yanku is a national security specialist. He has worked in the field of military research and education, international military cooperation and strategic planning, having relevant expertise on NATO, multinational operations, integrated planning and public policies in the security, defense and intelligence areas. He was the rector of Mihai Viteazu National Intelligence Academy in Romania. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Colonel. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining this early session of uh, our conference here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, um, uh, Romanian uh, defense staff and the Romanian military think tank team for uh, giving us this opportunity to contribute to such a fantastic event addressing a critically important topic of modern defense, security um, and defense uh, development and investments. Um, um, I'm the president of the Integrated Defense and Security Solutions. Um, it is a Romanian NGO established in Bucharest. Uh, we are dealing with uh, defense and security issues, uh, providing analysis on various uh, topics of major interest, also organizing uh, various events, uh, trying to deal with the, uh, let's say, hot topics uh, of the security uh, environment, the hot topics of the day. Um, I, I want to, to welcome um, the very distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for joining us in this morning. Uh, we have uh, Rear Admiral uh, Jon Christian Lichman, uh, his Deputy Chief of Defense for Resources. Uh, prior to this assignment, uh, Rear Admiral Lishman served as Commandant of the Naval Operational Component and Deputy Chief of Romanian Naval Forces, uh, Commander of the 39th Center for Dry, uh, Divers in Constanza, Chief of Staff and Deputy Commander of the 243rd Radio Electronic and Observation Center, Calatis. Uh, Rear Admiral Lishman is a graduate of uh, Carolente National Defense University, uh, the command and uh, staff faculty, uh, majoring in military sciences and intelligence, um, as well as of Mircea Celbatron Naval Academy, the faculty of navigation and naval engineering. Uh, Mr. Adrian Dutze, uh, he's the vice president of the Euro-Atlantic Resilience Center in Bucharest, uh, bearing the rank of undersecretary of state within the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Mr. Dutze has held uh, various positions within the Ministry of National Defense, uh, being an active officer with the rank of colonel, qualified as an Air Force pilot and intelligence officer. He's active with the academic community as visiting lecturer at the National Defense University. Uh, retired Brigadier General uh, Plamen Bogdanov, Associate Professor, uh, University of Library Studies and Information Technologies in Bulgaria. Uh, General Bogdanov uh, has held uh, various positions within the Ministry of uh, Defense, Bulgaria. He served as Chief of Staff and Deputy Chief of Staff at the Bulgarian Air Force HQ and Rector of uh, Vasilevsky National Military University. He is uh, the author of several books and over 50 publications in Bulgaria and abroad in the field of national, regional and global security. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel Cernat um, is the managing partner of Corporate Affairs Strategies. Prior to that, he worked for many years as senior managers of Maguire uh, Woods, um, a reputable uh, American lobbying company, active on the Romanian market until the end of 2019. Uh, before joining the consultancy domain, uh, Mr. Chernat served as a career diplomat acquiring a remarkable professional experience after fulfilling his duties over the years as personal advisor to several foreign ministers, as well as a, a diplomatic counselor to a number of ministers in charge with regional development, business, environment, and tourism. 
And last but not least, hoping to have him with us uh, today via the internet, uh, Dr. Thomas Durell Young. Uh, Professor Young is the academic advisor uh, to the president of the Defense Security Cooperation University in Washington, DC. Uh, Professor Young is also European Program Manager, Center for Civil Military Relations, Naval po uh, Postgraduate School, Monterey, California. His responsibilities are to develop and manage the execution of defense planning and management um, assistance projects throughout uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Dr. Yang also holds the position of uh, staff consultant uh, to the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, where he um, assesses defense planning and management issues. Uh, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the final title today is uh, Security Def and Defense Investments at the crossroad between the, Euro, uh, uh, the European Union Strategic Compass and the NATO 2022 Strategic uh, Concept. Um, as we already know, Romania announced a significant increase in military expenditures, including growing investments in research, development, and procurement of new defense capabilities. Uh, Romania's level of ambition um, aims to consolidate its defense posture um, in the Black Sea region, uh, on NATO eastern flank, and at the EU eastern border. Uh, Romania government considers that security starts at home, therefore Romania has committed to increasing its contribution to the Euro-Atlantic security burden sharing by investing in national defense capabilities. In the new strategic framework grown by the EU Strategic Compass and NATO 2022 strategic uh, concept, uh, the national endeavor must be coherent with the uh, EU security and defense initiatives, primarily European Defense Fund and uh, permanent structure cooperation and the NATO programs and innovation initiatives, uh, including uh, the brand new initiative, Diana. Um, a smart investment, ladies and gentlemen, uh, starts at home. Uh, it um, uh, requires a strengthened collaboration and effective contribution to the Europe, uh, European and allied projects with significant potential to enforce Romania's national defense strategy and its fu uh, future responsibilities derived from the uh, new NATO and EU strategic papers. Therefore, we aim to address today several important topics. Including, including the impact of the EU strategic compass in vast strength on European capabilities development, the new uh, 2022 um, uh, strategic concept of NATO uh, and member states' defense posture and their level of ambition within this new uh, strategic environment, uh, national and collective resilience, a new impetus for smart defense and security investments, and the strategic communication for enhanced cooperation in joint defense capabilities and uh, dealing with significant threats our societies um, uh, are facing nowadays. Now, uh, please allow me to invite our first speaker. Uh, to deliver his opening remarks. So, Rear Admiral um, uh, Lishman, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honorable audience. Uh, it's difficult to be the first. Uh, I think that uh, our moderator it's already started and opened the remarks, and uh, uh, he gave me the floor to. to and present all the topics that we try to cover. As a representative of Ministry of Defense, uh, I would like to present some facts and some uh, figures which will confirm that Ministry of Defense is deeply involved in the future of technology, how Romanian armed forces are connected with the most important project coming from European Union and NATO. And to give you my personal 
view how we can implement these two important concepts uh, in Romanian armed forces. At the beginning, I would like to try to uh, give you some uh, facts. Uh, Romanian armed forces, uh, basically on the Defense Strategic Analyst 2040, uh, focus to the five elements. Capabilities employing cutting edge technology, high skill and trained human resources, a well developed defense industry, and innovation based organi organization, culture, and resilience. These are the five elements that the, our chief of defense promote and try to figure out in our military plans. Connected with uh, uh, what uh, defense staff are connected with uh, starting, I will try to start with uh, uh, permanent structure cooperation PESCO project. We are uh, involved in, uh, and I give you exact number, in 20 PESCO projects and in 16 of them we are, well, we have status of member and in four of them we are uh, observers. So there are a lot of projects that defense staff are involved in the PESCO project. Regarding also the EDIP project, European Defense uh, Project, we participate in seven projects and uh, we also we have uh, participated in the, the other 16 projects that they are coming. Regarding European Defense Agency, we have to know uh, that we are cope in at least 19 uh, European Defense Agency projects at now. Um, connected with the NATO uh, uh, programs, what is important for us and develop uh, different type of projects regarding of investment, I would try to focus to the NATO Security Investment Program, NSIP. This NSIP uh, at now, Romanian Armed Forces playing at least 60 programs which are connected in infrastructures, command and control, new technologies, and uh, uh, deployable assets, communication and information systems, and crisis response facilities. Um, and ongoing, there are at least 45 projects NSIP, and you have to know that the budgeting of these NSIP programs are uh, coming from the both part NATO and Romania. So the result of these NSIP programs, they will, let's say, give us Romanian armed forces, new technology, new assets, new infrastructures uh, for the futures. Regarding uh, the project of Diana, NATO Defense Innovation Accelerator of North Atlantic, uh, what is uh, the most important from my perspective? Diana initiative uh, will cover at least 60 innovate, innovation sites name is accelerated sites, but connected with Romania. Uh, during a competition, they cho choose and uh, the two Romanian facility, they were promoted as the winners and the, these two centers are the Artificial Intelligence International Center of Excellence in the Faculty Automation and Computer in Polytechnic University and the second is National Institute of Aerospace Research, Eli Carafoli, Incas in Bucharest. So, Romanian Armed Forces participated in the Diana project, give the opportunity to the two important uh, organizations to be part of what NATO will promote in the future, to be not part just to, to have access of the new technology, but will be part of develop of new technology in the future. So there are few facts that uh, prove that Romania are very connected with European and NATO 
concept connected with new technology. From my personal uh, perspective, I would like to, to give you some uh, views, uh, taking in consideration uh, some thoughts. Romanian Ministry of Defense will have next year 2.5% uh, percent of, from GDP investment or procurement new capabilities. I, I would like to say that there will be more than 25, which is more than, with more than 5% than the media of average of the level four in NATO. That it means a lot. But from my perspective connected with the important word in the topic that we try to discuss today is investment. As a chief, uh, deputy chief of defense for resources are very important, the concept. They will give us a project today for the technology for tomorrow. But for me, it's what is important is to what technology and capability I can give to the forces today. So from my perspective, one, we have to, let's say, readapt our legislation according with NATO acquisition and investment and European and Euron acquisition laws. There are different perspectives to, to go to the main important facts from my perspective, to have a military capability, to have an acquisition and to have a contract. But now there are so many difficulties to, to, to make an arrangement. The second is to train and to l teach the people. The people are the most important uh, capability that the uh, country have to, so to, it's not enough to have the access to the new technology. You have to teach and to learn your people to, to be ready to be part of this new technology. And the last but not the least, the acquisition. Yes, we have, uh, each country have a specific law for acquisition. You have to put, if it's a common concept in NATO and a common concept in European Union, we have to put together all the criteria to, to, to try to figure out how we can manage common European project and NATO project. Otherwise, will be all the time a competition for who will win and who will give the capability. Thank you very much, um, Admiral Sir. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, topics, for your uh, perspectives on um, our topics today. I would su suggest to have all the panelists their um, speeches and in the end to open the floor for a Q&A session and to draw conclusion. Uh, therefore, I would suggest to pass to the next speaker uh, hoping to have Professor Yang from the uh, Washington DC with us now. I will pass the floor to Professor Yang. Am I coming through okay from here in Washington? Oh. Testing. Testing. Um, Bianco, can you hear me from Washington here? Um, I can hear Professor Yang very well. Excellent. Uh, can you speak louder, sir? Yes, yes indeed I can. Good. So I, so I will ask you to flip the slides. Um, good morning, everybody from Washington, D.C. Bona dimenata. Or here it's Bona sera, maybe. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Yanku and uh, General Danilo for inviting me to, to participate in this uh, uh, very interesting conference. I regret that I could not be there this week as we had planned. I had other more pressing uh, work here at the, the university we're creating and I simply couldn't get away. So thank you for your understanding and for making this available for me to speak to you virtually. Can we go to the next slide, please? I have to give you the standard disclaimer and um, after you hear what I have to say, you may understand better why I have to tell you that what I say does not reflect uh, the policy of my Department of Defense. It's merely my own, uh, shall we say, educated views, but they are in no way whatsoever reflective of U.S. policy. Next slide. Uh, 
I think we are in a completely different and new environment. And um, if you don't believe me, let's look at what happened yesterday on the eastern borders of Poland. I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time since 9-11 um, that um, a NATO nation has suffered a direct military hit from a foreign nation, non-NATO nation. So I think this puts us in a completely different frame of mind than when we were a year ago. Um, I also am of the view that this war is not just a war, and this is my own personal view, it's not just a war between Russia and Ukraine, but rather Ukraine in some ways is, is a victim of, of this. I see this as very much a proxy war by, by Moscow against us in the United States, in, in, in all of NATO. And we have to think of these things, you know, what could possibly be the outcome of all of this? You know, do we have any idea how this is going to end? And indeed, if, if the, our dear Ukrainian brothers are successful, you know, what does this look like for us? And particularly in the case of Romania, what does it look for? What does it look like for Romania being in the Black Sea? You know, and one of my fears I've been speaking to people here in Washington about is, you know, what happens? What could possibly, what could we do if the Russian army simply disintegrates, which it appears to be doing? Um, what then? What do we do? So, I, you know, I think at this point, we have no idea what, how this is going to end. It's clearly uncertain, but you know, there are some realities that we can identify. Whether victorious or defeated, I think Russia is still going to be quite dangerous for us. I think we can assume that. I think Ben Hodges is very prescient observation that the Russian Federation may not exist in five years is probably correct, but this does not necessarily um, mean that this is going to be better period for us in the West because a disintegrated, unstable Europe, uh, Russia with nuclear weapons is just not something that I have comfort in thinking about. Next slide. So how do we respond? I think from a defense planning and force development perspective, um, I, I've been saying this for many years, but I'm becoming more and more specific. I think we have to rethink how we perceive the use of money in defense. I'm not saying defense planning or defense budgeting. I think it's, we need to think differently about how we take a Romanian lay, how we take a, an American dollar and buy a capability, buy something that we can use that can put modern you know, capabilities on the battlefield. And I think we have to do a lot better job of doing that. And I would say that's that includes countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but I'm also talking about the United States, but let me, let me set that aside for the moment. I think in many ways, you know, we have to realize, we have to convince our political masters that the years of, of, of cheap defense um, in, 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 uh, in our respective governments in the region, these days are over. And I think we, this is a political decision, but I think, you know, what we've seen in Romania, we've seen in Poland, we see a, a new commitment to spending more money on defense. And I think this is very admirable. Well done, Romania, in particular. Um, but I think conversely, uh, if I may follow in with uh, Admiral Wiesman's very good comments, um, I think we in our defense institutions have to do a lot better job of how we manage and execute those defense budgets. And then when I bring in the particular case of Washington, I think we have to do a lot better job to include myself, how we provide advice, and even how we provide equipment and sell equipment to our allies. Um, and I mean this both in terms of donations as well as sales, because I think, don't think we're doing a very good job of it. Next slide. So what are the challenges? I think what we've, what we've seen over the last 30 years is that we have, I think we can agree that there's been chronic underfunding and chronic, un, uh, shall we say, non-modernization of, of defense forces and structures in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so it's really not so much a question of how much is being spent. Again, well done, Romania, 2.5% of GDP. But really, where is it being spent and, um, and, um, and on what? Um, I have to be the bearer of bad news, but I've never seen a country in the region that has ever made that very hard 
attempt to try to figure out how to how to uh, determine how much of the defense institution you can afford and make that fit within a realistic budget. Um, I think as a result of this is that most countries in the region, the defense budgets and the armed forces are out of balance. And what do I mean by that? Next slide. I don't know if you can see this very well. I apologize. I've tried to make the font as large as I can, but I wanted to give everybody a, a, a good database, good data set, and then uh, running over a number of years. But I think what you'll see, if you can see that font, is we have been out of balance for many, many years. Um, typically, a healthy defense budget is divided in thirds, a third on personnel, a third on acquisitions, and a third on uh, operations and maintenance. And if you can see the data, you can see that most countries have been out of balance for many years. Um, I'm not a big fan of the NATO target of 20% of budgets on acquisition, I think that's too low. Zero sum game, naturally other something else has to give, either a larger budget or you have to cut back in either personnel or in uh, training. But I think if you look, it's not so much if you look at those, those current figures or those current estimates, 2021, where if you look at example, Romania, which is close to being in, budget, in, in balance, if you go back prior years, Look at how all of these budgets are out of um, out of some old NATO nations. I won't point any fingers, but I could, if, if you like, can point Q and A. I certainly can. Is that there's an inability to plan properly with money. Uh, defense plans are rarely costed, and uh, even when this happens, it's very, very rare that you see provisions being made for assuming what the full life cost of that capability of that new procurement is and you know, factoring that into long-term financial liabilities. And indeed, I think we, I can ask the very indelicate and perhaps rude question, do defense institutions in the region truly know what their long-term financial liabilities are? You know, are cost models being used in planning and uh, are they proving to be useful? Instead, what I see is just an endless uh, number of uncosted and unrealistic long-term development plans uh, which are uh, which is often encouraged by the NATO international staff and also by Western allies. I think this is this is not the way we should be doing business. Is it, and here's the punchline. Here's the critical message to you: Is it any wonder that governments and ministries of finance, in particular, are skeptical, you know, to increase defense budgets? Um, unfortunately, many Americans have no idea that ministries of finance in, in many countries in the world particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. They live in their own environment, their own environment, their own world. So even though your budget may be X, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Ministry of Finance is going to find the money for you. Next slide. So some short-term objectives that I would suggest is that, you know, and I learned this the hard way uh, supporting the U.S. Army staff many, many years ago when I was at the Strategic Studies Institute at the Army War College. Uh, we were their, their their think tank, and you know you learned very quickly that when you went to meetings, if you did not have a costed pr priority, this is a priority that's been endorsed, and I know what it costs this year and the next four years. Nobody really wanted to talk to you at those critical meetings where they were deciding where the money was going to go, and so I have to say, in, in my many years of of doing this type of work, if if you don't have a costed priority. You'll really, you, you will never be able to plan uh, adequately. Very simple to say, but very hard to do. And about, about seven years ago, I did a study for our Navy staff um, uh, where, I, you know, I basically, you know, told them you're not doing planning, you're only doing programming. And my advice to them was that you have to use, you know, Microsoft Excel a lot more than you're using Microsoft Word if you want to have any influence in the planning process. So I think... You know, we have to accept that, you know, defense planning is trying to figure out how to spend the money at, you know, the most effective way we can. And, you know, we have to accept some realities. When we buy that procurement, you know, that's only 28% on average of the, um, the total life cost of what it is we bought. So factor it by three times over the lifetime of that equipment, that capability, that is what you're going to have to pay to keep it, to keep it going. And then we also have to increase 
that we also have to look very hard at what we call intergenerational costs. And that is to say, every year, certain capabilities become more expensive to maintain. Fighter aircraft, on average, 6%. You know, vehicles, 4 to 5%, 2 to 4% for submarines. What I'm saying is that these costs have to be factored into your long-term financial liabilities, and this is after inflation. So what the bottom line is, the longer you keep it, the more expensive it's going to come. There's no way around it. So somehow or another, you have to find money. Next slide, and it should be the last one, I think. How can we help? Well, I think, you know, old NATO nations, um, I don't think we've been very successful, and, and I blame myself as well in uh, the provision of, of advice. And uh, we have to be very careful, and I would say to you, be very careful to accept anything free from us because it's typically much more expensive than you ever would imagine. So be careful of free. And I think we have to be a lot better at how we can, um, when we provide you advice on how to do defense planning and budgeting. Frankly, I think we simply have to stop using or stop advocating the methods that simply have never been shown to work. Um, we have to do a lot better job on how we advise. And I would say that we need to be a lot more serious, finally, in how we sell and give donations to countries in the region. 333, Section 333, which of course Romania is benefiting from, as well as your own foreign military sales. Uh, you know, a little known fact is that when we in the Department of Defense, when we have a request from a nation, they want to buy a capability. When we go to vendors of defense industry and we ask them for the pricing and availability, we do not automatically and habitually ask them to provide what they think the long-term financial liabilities are, the life cycle costs of those capabilities. If you want that, it turns out you have to ask. Sometimes you have to pay for it. It's pennies on the pound, but you have to have it. So, you know, we need to do a lot better job of, of, of how we help you buy things and plan for them. Last slide, please. So to sum up, you know, we don't know the out, what the outcome of the war is going to be, but what we do know is that defense budgets must increase in order to maintain their current purchasing power. It's just the way it is, I mean, with, with inflation, but we have a double factor almost an accelerant to this in that, you know, Western defense industry capabilities have, have diminished incredibly in the last 30 years. And therefore, you know, if you want to buy something today, you have a long wait time. And so, you know, you're paying more, but you have to wait longer to buy it. And these are just realities that I don't see how they're going to be overcome in the short term. For example, if you want to buy a new F-16, you'll take delivery in 2030. We're only producing four per month. You know, that deal anti-aircraft uh, iris t you know surface air missile system you want to buy that well unfortunately they're only building four batteries a year and then we're only producing 150,000 rounds of 155 artillery shells this was in the press in the last few weeks um to 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 expand these these in industries is simply going to be much more expensive and it's going to take time so what I can say is that I think um, we have to be more effective in explaining these realities to our political masters. We have to hopefully get them to understand that the years of cheap defense are over. And I think for us, in our, those of us who are defense professionals, we simply have to be a lot better at convincing our political masters that we're spending their money effectively and efficiently. Dr. Yanku, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to speak to you from Washington out thank you very much tom thank you very much for your uh, thoughts um, um i know you can't uh, stay with us uh, till the end of this uh, session today anyway um if uh, participants have uh, questions for you i would pick them up at the end of this session i'm gonna send you via email and uh, we will deliver your uh, answers to the organizer here thank you very much professor yang i can say so far that we already have really convergent perspectives on future cap um, uh, capability developments 
uh, provided by the first two speakers in this panel, it is uh, of utmost importance to focus not only on the procurement part of the acquisition process, but also on the other uh, very important phases, including in um, operations, um, infrastructure and personnel. But uh, of course, we, are, we will come back to all these uh, topics at the end of this panel. And now I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Adrian Dutze to provide uh, his uh, presentation. The floor is yours, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, audience. It's a great honor for me to be here today to, co to talk about national and collective resilience and uh, in this context about investments in security and defense. I'm also grateful for this uh, opportunity as these days Bucharest uh, became the resilience capital of the Euro-Atlantic area with the Euro-Atlantic Resilience Center uh, organizing the forum taking place now in the Parliament Palace. The experience of the last years, a period of full of events with significant global impact, highlighted the need for governments to anticipate the major shocks, to identify solutions, to make viable plans adjusted to contemporary reality so that the states and their people can withstand and overcome a natural disaster, a failure of a critical infrastructure or a hybrid or armed attack. From this point of view, the resilience can be and has been already defined in a diff very different manner. First, as the capacity of uh, so so social system to bounce back and to use physical and economic resources eff effectively to aid recovery following exposure to hazards. <clears throat> Second, as a sustainable network of physical systems and human communities able of managing extreme events. Third, as the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while changing to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. All these definitions indicate that resilience refers to both the vulnerability of a system and its adaptive capacity. Overall, it can be summarized that resilience is the capacity of a community to resist, adapt, and recover, its functions and structures after a crisis or a disruptive event. But if we refer to the military resilience, the complexity of the subject implies to support the deterrence and defense through systems ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to threats and hazards, and to withstand, respond, and recover rapidly from strategic shocks. The resilience as uh, understood by NATO and the EU implies an interdependence between civilian preparedness and military capability. A closer interaction between the EU and NATO would allow them to be able to effectively, pre effectively prepare and respond to threats of any kind in a complementary manner and by providing mutual support uh, based on the principle of uh, inclusion while respecting at the same time the decision-making autonomy of each organization. The two organizations share the same values and face similar challenges. Challenges, Both EU member states and NATO allies expect their respective organizations to support them to act quickly, decisively, and in a coordinated manner in the event of a crisis or ideally to prevent crisis from occurring. A number of areas for closer EU cooperation, EU-NATO cooperation and coordination have been uh, identified, including Situational awareness, strategic communications, cybersecurity, crisis prevention, and crisis response. The adoption of the Alliance new strategic concept and the approval by the EU Council, Council of the Strategic Compass have, have created a steering space with many common elements that ensure development of the EU NATO responses. This space is vital for both organizations to be aware of any type of situation before and during the crisis. The two documents uh, also set the stage for increased interoperability of crisis or uh, war responses capability. Interoperability and complementarity 
of the spectrum of NATO EU responses are in an interdependent relationship and can only exist with the help of coordinated national investments in the field of security and defense. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, most EU countries have announced the intention to increase their military spending. Such increases are estimated at around 200 billion for the next few years. Actually, there are 216 billion uh, euros. The rise in national defense budgets by European countries represents both an opportunity and a challenge for the EU. The EU adoption of a strategic compass shows it, its willingness to give fresh impulse to its old aim of a progressive definition of a common defense policy. Two key challenges lie ahead, however. <clears throat> if Europeans are, if European, Europeans are too much new ambition with new means, while endeavors at EU level have typically tended to focus on long-term capabilities, short-term needs have taken precedence over the last few, last few weeks, last time. <clears throat> Europeans will thus need to strike a balance between short and long-term investments. They must be prepared for further military confrontation in the coming future, as well as for the possible wars and deterrence of 2030s and 2040s. In agreeing the NATO 2021 Strength and Resilience Commitment, allies have affirmed national and collective resilience as essential for credible deterrence and defense. Noting uh, resilience is first a national responsibility and then a collective commitment. Allied commitment to strengthen national and collective resilience anchored in uh, Article 3 of the Washington Treaty Resilience of the Alliance contribute to the successful deterrence and defense strategy by enhancing the Alliance's ability to absorb shocks and ensure access to and continuity of critical services and government functions, including in support of military operations in peace, crisis and conflict. While resilience represents, an, represents a continuum across the civil and military instruments of power, this suggests a layered approach comprising the two mutually reinforcing layers of military and civil resilience with numerous touch points and interdependencies. Layered resilience will develop in line with NATO broader resilience work and 2021 summit out outcomes, including the strength and resilience commitment and NATO seven baseline requirements for national resilience. Uh, as well as uh, the NATO 2030 agenda decisions and uh, estab on establishing resilience objectives and national developed goals. Furthermore, the layered resilience concept will align itself with the NATO Resilience Committee established this year and consider the current NATO strategic concept. I uh, make a parenthesis here. I uh, am proud to announce that uh, the Euro Atlantic Center for Resilience, uh, uh, together with the Ministry, Ministry of uh, Defense, organized this year the first seminar on uh, layered resilience concept for NATO. The, mini the military resilience theme of perseverance, one of the seven domains of the thematic framework for military resilience, includes in its broad scope the long-term sustainment, defense industrial base, including shipyards, battle decisive munitions, capability to increase production and supply chains. To ensure access to these critical items, the military requires a good relationship with the private sector's entities it relies upon for these goods and services. Addressing, the, addressing these issues could help NATO's approach to resilience, but also a horizontal integration with the approaches of other international bodies, such as uh, the European Commission or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The war in Ukraine made a major contribution to the awareness process of the need for a much closer collaboration between NATO and EU in the field of security. Although NATO institutional relations have evolved since 1998 St. Malo Declaration, effective and coherent cooperation is still lacking. The common elements in the two documents adopted by NATO and EU help to overcome the deadlock caused at the political level to illustrate both formal and informal cooperation between NATO and the EU, both at the center headquarters and, joint mission, and in joint missions. 
This joint communication sets out actions to help counter all types of threats and strengthen resilience at NATO and EU level, at national level, as well as, at part, as, well as partner resilience. Actions were presented to strengthen resilience in areas such as cybersecurity, critical infrastructure, protecting the financial system from illicit uses, as well as efforts to counter violent extremism and radicalization. In each of these areas, the implementation of the strategies agreed by the member states, as well as their full implementation of the legislations in force, will be an important first step. The next step could be the initiation of more concrete actions in order to further consolidate these efforts, the most important being directing the strategic investments of the member states to the security and defense sector. Uh, I will not pass through the um, permanent structure cooperation pay, uh, program, the coordinated annual review defense. You know this uh, very well. I will go further and uh, I will talk about the NATO EU cooperation. The ultimate, the ultimate goal of these plans, uh, meaning Diana program, PESCO, CARD, and all the others at NATO, NATO and EU level is to strengthen the defense and deterrence posture at the national level through the development over time and based on well-directed investments of those types of forces and capabilities that allow to respond to any possible aggressor, regardless uh, of the size of his force, in a manner that would make aggression against NATO and EU too expensive to attempt. For this, five essential elements are necessary, the development of which is consistently pursued by the institutions responsible for defense planning. High-tech capabilities, a highly educated and well-trained human resource, a strong domestic defense industry, the development of a focused institutional culture on knowledge and innovation, and last but not least, resilience. All these projects, programs and guidelines prepared at NATO and EU level constitute an opportunity for Romania to achieve its objective in the field, objectives in the field of security and defense stipulated in the military strategy through which it was launched, the program Armed Forces 2014. In this context of the decision to allocate 2.5% of GDP for defense starting with uh, 2023, there are established all the prerequisites for the creation of an armed forces structure with a high combat capacity, equipped with modern equipment, interoperable with those of the allies, able to deploy quickly on the national territory or to support our allies, self-sustainable and with multidimensional means of protection with a flexible and efficient command and control system. The main directions of actions of action are the reconfiguration of endowment program, programs and efforts to restore stocks, the modernization of the defense industry, as well as the measures for better maintenance, uh, actually retention of qualified military personnel. The return of war in Europe, as well as the multiple threats and challenges in the global security environment, require the immediate, uh, immediate implementation of the directions drawn by the new NATO concept 2022, and the EU strategic compass. They propose co concrete actions as well as uh, timetables for their implementation and the area of investments in security and defense are considered essential. Cooperation between NATO and the EU is also essential and this cooperation has reached the stage where relevant NATO and EU initiatives are fully transparent to member states while avoiding the creation of a new technological dependencies or the aggravation of the old ones as well as the creation of interoperable capabilities at the organizational level. As a final conclusion, I can say that resilience could be ensured by well-targeted investments in security and defense to ensure interoperability of common capabilities at NATO and EU level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vice President Abduza. Uh, and now I'm gonna invite um, retired uh, Brigadier General Plamen Bogdanov to deliver his speech. General, the floor is yours. Good 
morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues at the panel. I'm going to attack you with information, much information, most of it well known, but this is intentionally. Uh, that's why don't worry, uh, we are, will not be the target. Next slide, please. In the last decade of the 20th century, there was two major multinational operations. You know, Desert Storm in the region of Persian Gulf and Allied Force in 1999 in the former Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. These operations have shown certain disbalances between the capabilities of the armed forces of the United States and those of their European allies, including in the sphere of precision striking, mobility, and command control and communications. For this reason, next slide, please. A defense capabilities initiative was approved in 1999 by the heads of state and governments of NATO member states. The objective of this in initiative was to improve defense capabilities to ensure the effectiveness in future multinational operations across the full spectrum of alliance missions in the present and foreseeable security environment, with a special focus on improving interoperability among alliances. It was taken into account that significant progress have been made in recent years in adapting uh, alliance forces capabilities to the requirements of the new security environment. However, it was concluded that many allies have only relatively limited capabilities for the rapid deployment of significant forces outside national territory or for in extended sustainment of operations and protection of forces far from a home basis. So improvements of interoperability and critical capabilities should also strengthen the European pillar in NATO. Next slide, please. In con conjunction with this, the ambitions, the ambitions of uh, European Union have also been expanded. At the European Council meeting in Kjol in June 1999, member states declared their resolve that the European Union shall play its full role on the international stage. The Union must have the capacity for autonomous action backed up by credible military forces, the means to decide to use them, and a readiness to do so. The Helsinki European Council, in December the same year, underlines its determination to develop an autonomous capacity to take decisions and where NATO as a whole is not engaged to launch and conduct EU-led military operations in response to international crisis. In the field of military capabilities, which will complement to the other instruments available to, available to the Union, at the Council, the Member States set themselves the headline goal of being able by 2003 to deploy within 60 days and sustained for at least one year forces up to core level 60,000 persons capable of full range of Petersburg tasks. These forces should be military self-sustaining with the necessary command control and intelligence capabilities, logistics, other combat support units, and as required air and naval elements. This was a military target known as the Helsinki Headline Goal 2003. Next slide, please. At the same council, member states had also decided rapidly to identify the collective capability goals in the field of command and control, its challenges, and strategic transport. You can see on the slide. It remains 
essential to the credibility and effectiveness of the European security and defense policy that the European Union's military capabilities for crisis management be reinforced so that the EU is in position to intervene with or without recourse to NATO assets. The European Capability Action Plan was launched at the end of 2001 to remedy identified shortfalls in the Helsinki headline goal. Follow, following the adoption of European security strategy in 2003, the EU decided to set a new headline goal, 2010. It was building on the headline goal 2003, and it envisages by the member states to be able by 2010 to respond with rapid and decisive action applying a fully coherent approach to the whole spectrum of crisis management operations covered by the Treaty of the European Union. The first step, next slide please, the first step was to identify strategic planning assumptions. Five illustrative scenarios were prepared. From these scenarios, focused military options were developed for how best to deal with the relevant crisis. These options led to a planning framework from which was derived a detailed list of the capabilities. Generic force packages were compiled, which identified the type of forces groupings that the EU would require to solve the crisis. This in turn resulted in the list of reference units and fed into a requirements catalog. After coordination process, an EU force catalog was compiled with detailed military capabilities, which will be available by 2010. Next slide, please. In May 2004, with a view to the EU ambitions on rapid response, the Council recognizes in particular the need to achieve further progress in improving capabilities and strategic mobility. Strategic transport is one of the key enablers for the EU battle groups. That's why in the context of headline goal 2010, strategic lift coordination with a view to achieving by 2010 necessary capability and full efficiency of strategic lift air, land and sea in support of anticipated operations. The headline goal 2010 adopted in May recognizes that existing shortfalls still need to be addressed. In November 2004, member states took part in the Military Capability Commitment Conference, making it possible to draw together the specific national commitments corresponding to the military capability goals set by Helsinki Council. The single progress report in November 2004 summarizes and assesses the progress of the European Capability Action Plan and identifies the work that remains to be done to remedy the remaining military shortfalls under the Helsinki headline goal. Next was the EU force catalog underwent the first version in September and uh, the force catalog 2009. Also earlier work on examining the contribution that naval and air forces can make to the ESDP rapid response operations resulted in adoption by the EU military committee in late 2007 of a maritime rapid response concept and air rapid response concept followed by the revised military rapid response concept. The next slide please. The progress catalog resulted in a, as a key contribution to the capability development, development plan in 2008. The EDA steering board initiated work on an initial group of 12 capability areas, which we see. So, with so many defined priorities, deficits in the military capabilities, of the EU, by the end of 2008, 
the evolution of the EU heads of state and governments is overly optimistic. They have endorsed an analysis of the implementation of the uh, 2003 European strategy, security strategy. Next slide, please. Building on the EU global strategy um, for 2016, in November the same year, was presented an implementation plan focusing on security and defense to raise the level of ambition of the European Union security and defense policy. The actions needed to fulfill the new level of ambition, ambition are built around the three strategic priorities derived from the global strategy. You know, to respond to the external conflicts, building the capacity of partners, and protecting the European Union. Some of the main actions under implementation you can see on the slide number nine. So, uh, the PESCO were mentioned. I will not go again to, the, to this topic. With uh, 47 number of projects. Next slide, please. The 2018 Capability Development Plan was of particular strategic significance as it serves as a baseline and reference to the implementation of major European defense initiatives launched following the 2016 EU Global Strategy, the coordinated annual review on defense, the permanent structured cooperation PESCO, and the European Defense Fund. The most tangible output of this uh, uh, capability development plan Division are the 11 new EU capability development priorities on short term, mid term, and long term trends. Capability shortfalls analysis and lessons learned from recent CSDP operations, plan capabilities, and the potential for future European cooperation in each of the capability domains. During the meeting in November 2019, the Council approved the EU Requirements Catalog 2019, which identifies the military capabilities requirements for CSDP and takes into account the three strategic priorities set out under the EU Global Strategy. Next slide, please. You well know at the summit uh, of NATO Last year, the leaders endorsed the NATO 2030 agenda with uh, nine proposals of the Secretary General. One of them, which was launched, this is a uh, Diana project that was mentioned before, as a um, next initiative with the seven key disruptive technologies, was, which also were mentioned. Next slide, please. Following NATO initiatives and Russian aggression against Ukraine started this year, and working to be a partner in security and defense, the EU needs to become a stronger and more capable global actor in security and defense. In the totally different capability environment, in March this year, the Council approved the strategic campus, which is a common strategic vision for the EU role in security and defense and commit to a set of concrete and wide-ranging objectives to achieve the goals in the coming five to ten years. With four work stands, which is known, but I would like to mention just one of the text under ambitions to act to develop an EU rapid deployment capacity that will allow the EU to swiftly deploy up to 5,000 troops. Also, again, to strengthen 
the EU command and control structures and again to enhance military mobility and life uh, exercises. So, next slide. At the same critical time for the security and the international peace and stability, in June this year, you know, was endorsed a new NATO strategic concept in which is recognized the European Union as a an unique and essential partner for NATO. According to the document, NATO and the EU play complementary, coherent and mutually reinforce, reinforcing roles in supporting international peace and security. And, uh, on the basis of uh, their long-standing cooperation, the alliance will enhance the NATO-EU strategic partnership, strengthen political consultation and increase cooperation in issue of common interest. These are military mobility, resilience and another, another topic well known. And finally, next uh, slide of this uh, steps, many steps, was the new national security strategy of the United States launched uh, last month, which uh, is in, in the time when the post Cold War era is definitely over and the competition is underway between the major powers to shape what comes next. The new strategy recognizes that Europe has been and will continue to be US foundational partner in addressing the full range of global challenges. It to be need to, to raising the level of ambition in the US, US EU relationship. In the strategy, it's also underlined that the EU U.S. will count on its allies to continue assuming greater responsibility by increasing their spending, capab spending capabilities and contributions. Uh, Euro European defensive measures, true or complementary to NATO, will be critical to ensuring our shared security at the time of intensified competition. Few words for one of the key capabilities that you need, which was identified as a deficiency. Next slide, please. Uh, concerning uh, the strategic transport, while European NATO members will still face a heavy aircraft deficit, the situation was at least improved since the 1990s. Until the arrival of the first Royal Air Force C-17 in 2001, Europe did not have any strategic airlift. The needs of EU strategic airlift was uh, identified in 2005 as a key capability gap. That's why various multinational initiatives have been undertaken in order to secure the availability of assets or to use available assets. You see on the slide, Salis was complemented by NATO's strategic airlift capabilities. After that, EDA decided on, in 2008 to establish uh, various models of European air transport fleet and 14 member states signed, next slide please, signed the European Air Transport Fleet uh, letter of intent in 2009, a decade on progress in many modest. Although Europe's heavy airlift deficit was improved since the beginning of the 21st century, Further advances are required to fulfill European and NATO military ambitions. You see what was 
planned in 2014 for the 2000 uh, for 2020. This number. Next slide, please. Strategic and outsized airlift has long been an issue for European NATO nations, with a reliance on the United States to provide almost all this capacity. The United Kingdom's acquisition of Boeing C-17 and laterally the introduction of Airbus A400 has helped to address this. Thank you. Yes. This is on the table. You can see the number of United States and European heavy transport aircraft. Uh, this in this period. So the continued mobility challenge for NATO was underscored by a June in one uh, British uh, parliamentary report, which stated that NATO would probably, next slide please, NATO would probably have to rely on strategic airlift to transport forces, but airlift capacity is scarce amongst NATO European alliances. So next slide. Next slide. So in conclusion, in the time span of more than two decades, the EU has started many initiatives and undertaken steps in order to develop military capabilities. As I mentioned, many plans, implementation plans, capability development plans, many priority lists, many initiatives, initiative made by NATO, by US, and nevertheless, all these activities, next slide, the main allied operations in the 21st century, like those in Iraq, Afghanistan, etc., have clearly demonstrated that many European NATO nations still have relatively limited capabilities for the rapid deployment of significant forces outside national territory and for extended sustainment of operations for far from home bases. That's why the, the open questions for me, are, or maybe one question is, what will the trigger, the real trigger uh, of the EU to develop, to develop the, this all military capabilities needed uh, nowadays, it could be NATO, it has trying uh, many years, maybe US, or maybe war in Ukraine will be this trigger to have needed EU military capabilities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Bogdanov. And now, uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Chernat. So, uh, Mr. Chernat, the floor is yours. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the panels, thank you first of all very much uh, for inviting me, dear Mr. Yanku. Uh, it is a real privilege to be here alongside my reputable panel colleagues. When I learned about the topic of this panel as a former career diplomat, I knew from the very beginning that my contribution to this panel will relate to an area that I personally do consider of utmost importance, taking into consideration the global and especially regional context, namely the information warfare as an integral part of the hybrid war concept. The date of February 24th will remain in history as a date when the security structure, the international system and the immediate reality of the world changed in an irreversible manner, comparable only to the infamous date of 9-11. The changes brought about by the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation are too numerous to list. Among them, the way in which, in Europe at least, the war suddenly became, from a reminiscence of distant past, a tangible reality, a threat that affects the daily existence of the population. The countries have understood today that the war 
is no longer just a closed chapter of history, but that the threat of it, unfortunately, looms over everyone and the states cannot afford to wait, but must prepare in a proactive manner. The conflict in Ukraine has determined the neighboring countries in the entire region, and not only, to reflect on their own defense capabilities, but not only to reflect, but also to act to start modernizing them or develop new technologies that at some point, if needed, will protect its territories. In France, for example, one of the largest armed forces in Europe, in March, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee acknowledged the fact that in a case of a long-term intensive conflict, France would be able to support by herself such a conflict for only a maximum of two weeks due to its limited ammunition stockpiles. It is obvious under these conditions that in the near and medium future, we will witness not necessarily an arms race, but rather a race of countries to prepare their military capabilities. If we refer to the commitment assumed by NATO member states regarding the allocation of 2% of GDP for defense budgets, we must say that not long ago, only a third of NATO members qualified in the so-called 2% club. Today, the reality of war makes the respective 2% most likely to become the lower limit that NATO states will allocate to defense capabilities. The 2.5% of the Romanian GDP allocated to defense starting with 2023 represents the core of the Romanian strategy to boost the endowment of the Romanian army. But the war in Ukraine has taught us something extremely important. Military capabilities are essential, but an extremely relevant component, as seen in Ukraine many times, decisive in tilting the balance of victory, is represented by the population the morale of the people and the way in which they relate to and get involved in supporting the military efforts. The world has entered more than ever into a stage of global uncertainty, and the risk of nuclear confrontation is looming more than ever, dragging, paradoxically, the belligerents into the field of immaterial conflicts. When we speak about security architecture, we tend to mainly think about defense systems or military structures. However, the war in Ukraine showed us that the war waged is far from being limited to a conventional one and has a hybrid dimension at least as significant. If we are to look at how hybrid war is identified in NATO's understanding, we must note that the concept of hybrid warfare reportedly emerged initially back in 2005 and was a term linked to developments in the conflicts of, in Afghanistan and Iraq to describe a war against the rights of non-state actors using unconventional tactics and methods, such as guerrilla warfare, ambush, or terrorism. Since then, the concept of hybrid warfare has become an established term in the Western strategic lexicon and has also been gradually integrated into the defense and security doctrines of NATO member states alongside with the broadening of the concept, which loses its original, which uh, loses its original meaning to describe another way of waging war that relies in whole or in part on originally non-military means such as cyber attacks, propaganda and disinformation, impediments to trade and access to energy resources, interference in electoral processes and many other examples. Nonetheless, one of the most important aspects that need to be prioritized is the information warfare. The ongoing war in Ukraine has demonstrated that the speed of communication with wide coverage can play a critical role, especially in conflict situations. Even though these are not necessarily new tactics of hybrid war, propaganda and disinformation are now tools that are used through all media channels traditional on television or over the internet. Whether we are talking about social media or the online press, the specific objectives that are usually on the top of these tactics is to distort the reality, disseminate specific messages, or influence certain communities. And we have seen over the last years how many people got confused between contradictory information 
coming from all kinds of sources that in the end reflected the result of a high level of disinformation. A famous aphorism said that in any war, the first casualty is always the truth. And this is all the more true when we talk about an informational war. And if, from a military point of view, NATO and Europe are not belligerents in the conflict in Ukraine, in terms of the informational war, we can already speak of a war of attrition started since the 2014 invasion of Crimea, when Moscow did everything possible to impose its version of the truth on the invasion. Back then, NATO and the EU were caught on the wrong foot. And for a long period of time, it was the Russian Federation that won battle after battle. Gradually, however, the Western world understood that it cannot afford to let Russia have the upper hand. And over time, the initially lost ground was recovered. Today, as a result of concerted efforts, the battle is far from being won. However, NATO and its allies are prepared and how and know how to respond in an efficient manner to the informational attacks and aggressive propaganda of the Russian Federation. Yet, as a paradox, another hindrance of the West in pursuing the same tactics uh, as its Russian opponent is linked to its values. The idea of officially using propaganda, which can be considered the art of channeling public opinion to have and or support certain ideas, triggers painful memories related to World War II and thus is badly perceived at public opinion level. The weapons of the informational war are cyber attacks, disinformation and fake news. The soldiers of this war are the propagandist journalists who disseminate a distorted vision of reality, the trolls paid to polemize and divert the attention of internet users from real topics, and boots which are computer programs activated by words and which create fake content that is subsequently multiplied uncontrollably in the virtual space. The battlefields of the, inform of the information war are the internet, media space, and social networks. And of course, the victims of the informational war are extremely diverse and reach from individuals to entire societies. The fact that this war is taking place on several simultaneous fronts, including the informational one, is not necessarily a novelty. But the tools available to those involved represents the differentiating element of this war. Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Telegram, Instagram, Snapchat, Vcontacte, never has a war generated so much attention and interaction on social networks. The incredible development of access to information and the ability to disseminate information in real time and on, glo on a global scale, doubled by the efforts of the stakeholders in this war to control or influence the way information is transmitted or received, makes it almost impossible to have access to impartial and unbiased information. The realm of news is forever shrouded by the fog of war, which, like in a labyrinth of mirrors, distorts reality depending on the point from which you look. Gradually, the artisan of the informational war succeeded through a skillful game of manipulation, misinformation and propaganda to obtain exactly what they wanted. Namely, that a certain part of society would come to believe blindly in the information that is offered in abundance in its informational bubble, and another part of society, because of the countless smoke screens, to stop believing absolutely anything of what they learn, regardless of the credibility of the sources or of the one who issues the message. Romania, located at the confluence of the Western world and the East, must watch very carefully and learn as much as possible from the Ukrainian lessons. With the support of its North Atlantic allies, the Kyiv government has developed in recent years increased capabilities to counter the Kremlin's interference attempts. In addition, since the beginning of the, uh, the, this year's war, the Ukrainian government has designed and carried out a remarkable, sophisticated informational campaign in an effort to shape global opinions to boost the morale of the Ukrainians and deter Russian soldiers. 
the forced, forced dissemination of all the videos that spoke about the heroism of the Ukrainian resistance, the association with the drama of the struggle for survival of a hilarious dimension, such as the theft of the tank uh, by a tractor uh, led by a fearless Ukrainian peasant, or the viral spread of the efficiency of portable anti-tank missile system and its subsequent sanctification as Saint Javelin. Here are just a few examples of elements that seem random, but in fact were extremely carefully constructed and promoted in the virtual public space in a concerted effort to generate a wave of support for the Ukrainian cause, both domestically and internationally. We must also emphasize the daily video messages of the leader from Kyiv, who understood that it is necessary to demonstrate to his own population that there is a continuity of the governing act despite the inherent Russian threat. Personalized messages adapted to each official international interlocutor also played an important role. In short, Volodymyr Zelensky understood how to use the information environment to his advantage. Romanian experts and their colleagues from NATO countries have enough material for the years to come to dissect, deepen and learn from the Ukrainian information efforts. But perhaps the most important lesson that we all have to learn is that these informational capabilities are not acquired overnight, but are the result of sustained efforts over the last years. And this is obvious if we compare in the mirror the communication strategy and how the Kyiv government knew to implement this strategy in 2022 compared to 2014, when the leadership's repeated fumbles at that time did nothing but fuel Russia's narrative of the Ukrainian government inability to lead, fact which led to the absence of a strong reaction of the United Western world, as we have seen this year. If in the case of conventional war, the targets of the attacks, as well as the battles, are carried out by soldiers prepared to face such conflicts, in an informational war, the victims are simple people who most of the time are not even aware of the fact that they are combatants in these fights. To conclude, I just want to add another fundamental difference between conventional and hybrid warfare. In the case of the latter, there is no Geneva Convention to delim delimit the rules of this conflict and to sanction abuses and protect non-combatants. The only thing that states and their defense structures can do to protect their citizens is to boost their resilience by ensuring anticipatory communication strategies that increase awareness of the potential risk they may face. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chernat, uh, for your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for your contribution to this panel. Uh, please allow me to draw brief conclusions at the end of uh, speeches, and uh, after that I'm going to invite all of you for a Q&A session. So, um, some uh, takeovers. Um, Admiral Lishman mentioned that the Ministry of uh, Defense is deeply involved in the development of uh, future the, um, defense capabilities. Uh, defense staff pursues a particular approach uh, consisting of a uh, number of phases, five phases, including uh, capabilities employment, uh, personal training, and uh, the resilience of uh, future capabilities. Also, defense staff contributes to a significant number of uh, PESCO and DDF projects. Uh, there are some numbers Admiral uh, uh, um, uh, gave us. Um, also, he mentioned that uh, Romania is determined to, uh, to um, uh, pursue this goal of 2% uh, uh, from GDP for allocating 2% of GDP to the to defense and at least 20%, maybe up to 25% to the uh, development of uh, future um, um, uh, defense uh, capabilities. And in the end, uh, there, uh, there are some uh, certain commitments, urgencies, I, was, I would say, urgencies of the day. 
The first one is the uh, reviewing of the legislation uh, to align it with the allied um, uh, legal framework and the existing trends uh, within the allied and European framework to let us as be uh, more effective in dealing with challenges uh, coming from the uh, future uh, procurements. The second, uh, um, the people are the most important capability. Uh, that's why um, uh, training and uh, education are relevant, are critically important parts of uh, human resources uh, development. And uh, in the end, uh, it is important to deconflict, I would say, the uh, acquisition criteria uh, coming from various uh, um, uh, programs uh, at the EU and NATO levels to join the national efforts to uh, provide much more coherently uh, future uh, defense capabilities. Uh, Professor Yang, uh, he mentioned that the Russian-Ukrainian war has changed the European security paradigm. Um, that's why we have to improve uh, how we manage defense money. Um, uh, it sounds, uh, let's say, uh, mercantile, but anyway, it is a quite important part of uh, um, uh, defense uh, strategic planning. Uh, uh, it is no... Um, um, important or, or only important uh, how much money to invest but also how to spend the existing money. Uh, he also um, um, mentioned that together with the procurement part of the acquisition process uh, there are also other phases of uh, same importance uh, nowadays he concluded that uh, only 28% of the total life cycle cost um, relies belong to the procurement part, but uh, a significant uh, money must be also directed towards the uh, equipment, maintenance, infrastructure, and the personal uh, training. Uh, Mr. Dutz uh, pointed out the role of resilience at the national and international, uh, within the national and international security environments. Uh, we already know, uh, taking from the NATO 2022 strategy concept, that resilience is the first and last line of defense. Uh, it reflects the ability of a society to resist, adapt, and recover after a wide range of shocks. Uh, from natural disasters to military attacks. Um, th therefore, resilience is the new impetus for, in for an enhanced EU-NATO cooperation. Um, uh, resilience um, exists more in a continuum than uh, as a um, uh, fact, let's say, um, it is important to manage um, a successful balance between short and long-term investments uh, and to have a, hor a horizontal integration with other uh, resilience uh, programs, initiatives, investments uh, governed by various organizations in Europe and across the world. Um, General Bogdanov uh, provided us um, uh, review of the historical decisions NATO and EU made into the defense capability uh, realm. Um, he mentioned that uh, there, there are certain stages of the um, uh, capability development uh, uh, within NATO and the EU uh, that uh, made uh, possible current developments uh, in capability development program EDF and PESC uh, and uh, the, uh, Diana at NATO level. Uh, he also uh, paid a particular attention to the current uh, gaps in strategic transport, mentioning the NATO strategic airlift fleet 
uh, which is a NATO initiative, a NATO ongoing initiative uh, dealing with uh, strategic transport. Uh, and in the end, uh, Mr. Chernat mentioned that information warfare is an integral part of a hybrid, uh, hybrid war um, concept. Uh, he gave us a lot of examples from uh, mainly the Ukrainian war, but also from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, pointing out uh, the criticality of uh, this information and its uh, malign effects on uh, population morale. Um, he mentioned that uh, fake news, uh, disinformation and propaganda are modern weapons in the uh, contemporary hybrid warfare. Uh, the battlefields are internet, social media and TV cables and victims um, are people all over the world. So that being said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, will invite you to address questions to our panelists here today. We have a 15 minute session for this part of our panel. So please, yes, uh, introduce yourself, yes. and. Just give us a second because uh, there is a microphone here helping us to hear you. Yes, uh, much better. Thank you very much. So, yes, absolutely wonderful panel. Mario Marin of uh, Unibit Bulgaria. Now, I have a question that will be addressed uh, towards uh, Mr. Uh, Gita and uh, Rear Admiral Lishman to perhaps get both the civilian uh, political perspective and the military one, specifically on uh, some of the criticisms towards uh, the PESCO program. And there is no question that the dedication and investment of Romania is on the level perhaps beyond it, but going to the higher systemic level of uh, Things, a lot of criticism has been addressed towards PESCO that perhaps it is uh, mirroring or taking away from potential uh, capability development within the NATO framework and the development of NATO capabilities within the NATO uh, concept. And as we saw from the presentation of Professor Young, the dynamic of military budgets and production is changing. Uh, from the presentation of General Boganov, we saw that the EU has had a long history of attempts to remedy deficiencies. So how would the two of you address those criticisms that exist towards PESCO? In my opinion, they're somewhat unfounded, but it would be wonderful to hear perhaps some of your perspectives and opinions on the matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have any preference uh, of who to answer first? or Absolutely no, no. no. Okay, so Admiral, sir, please. Thank you for the questions. Um, first of all, it's not a competition between uh, PESCO program, European uh, initiative, with uh, uh, NATO initiatives. From our perspective, they are complementary. Together, give the opportunity to the NATO and Euro country to have new capabilities. Despite of uh, all the criticism, I'd like to give you some facts. PESCO can integrate funds, research and development uh, initiative, and how to, to give a solution. Yes, it's a better of time of delivery for a military capability. And the number of the members of the EU which are involved in the projects at, at the time of the research period, or they will buy the final solution they will propose. Uh, NATO come with a different aspect. They will give uh, not a direct military capability, but a solution very close to the military capability, easy to be procured. But the both systems have the same issue that I raised it at the, my speech at the beginning. How will approach each country to buy it? So from this perspective, they give us solutions military capabilities, but we have difficult uh, procedures to, 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 to buy. This is our, my point of view. 
Would you like to add something? Yes, please. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I will not enter any details about PESCO, but uh, I'd like to highlight the fact that uh, we have to adapt uh, all the time our investments program because creating military capability means long-term investments, but uh, the reality um, implies to have capability right now. Uh, lessons learned from Ukraine war, it's, it's clear that uh, we cannot wait four, five, ten years to have a capability. We should have it now, and this process is a continuum one. Uh, we cannot wait to have the capability on long term. We have to, to have the capability right now. Uh, speaking about the critics, there will be all the time with all the programs. Doesn't matter the, the manner. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, I would uh, bet something. In fact, uh, PASCO and um, uh, NATO's Defense Capability Initiative uh, have common roots. So uh, they are already deconflicted from the very beginning of their existence. Um, of course, they evolved within their uh, um, individual frameworks within EU and NATO. But uh, in the end, uh, the member states are pretty much the same. So it is a national responsibility to deconflict uh, um, national contributions to various programs under the EU and the NATO auspices. Uh, and it is, not also, uh, it is not only about investment in, in itself, it is also about uh, the conflicting, uh, the, conflicting um, uh, um, uh, the characteristics of uh, future capabilities, as Admiral mentioned early in, the, in this morning. Um, I mean to, to provide uh, or to, to, to contribute to a common framework for uh, uh, developing a joint um, 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 capability uh, characteristics uh, framework uh, within, under the auspices of all existing initiatives. Any other question? Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm a retired Colonel Kreishor Ionitsa from the National Defense University, Carol the First. My question is for Mr. Dutza. Um, we are very proud to have a NATO Center for Resilience here in Romania. And the question is, uh, what are your relationship as uh, Vice President with the Romanian um, institutions responsible for resilience? and how you consider uh, the national uh, work, what they are doing in order to solve the issue of resilience in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for your question. Uh, first, I will refer at uh, our center. Uh, in 2021, the center has been created and it has been assumed at the Euro-Atlantic uh, level. We are proud to be part of this initiative and uh, we would like to become a relevant center for Euro-Atlantic uh, area. Um, yesterday we announced that uh, we are uh, operational and uh, we are open to the process to become an international organization bringing to, to us experts from all over the world. Our intention is to approach the resilience uh, in a very comprehensive manner, not only from the security perspective, but also the, well, from many other perspective, uh, to cover a pillar of NATO, EU, UN, if possible, and also a resilience for the states from the neighborhood, non-EU, non non-NATO states from the neighborhood, like the, the Black Sea. Um, we are involved in um, all, all the matters, uh, speaking about the concept development, uh, strat strategies, policies, uh, research in the resilience domain. We are working with all the stakeholders. We would like to bring together around the table um, the academia, uh, private sector, um, state institution, because 
when we talk about resilience, we talk about the horizontal connections. And we already um, tested this. Uh, in, a few weeks ago, we organized a TTX in Constanza and we invited uh, 22 entities to take part in this exercise with uh, 14 uh, civilian entities. And uh, our conclusions are uh, really good because when we talk about resilience, we don't talk only about the military instrument of power, and we talk about the civilian instrument of power, and we have to put them together in order to address all the, all the vulnerabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir, please. Good day. My name is Horna Ionel. I am former colonel in <coughs> Minister of Defense. And I want to send a question for Mr. Dutta. Do you see a compatibility between security capa uh, <coughs> capability and defense capability? And if you see this compatibility, is big or less? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, I don't know if I understood very well the, the question, but... Uh, uh, Yes, we have to work in order to have this compatibility, inter, uh, interoperability, and even to have uh, capabilities that could be interchangeable between the allies, between the, the forces. I come with an example. I've been defense attaché in Portugal, and uh, I was there during an exercise with F-16. They had a very advanced exercise uh, using uh, weapons, uh, missiles, and one of the officers told me that uh, they use Polish, um, now um, Portuguese uh, aircrafts, um, Belgian uh, crew, and also some um, other countries' uh, missiles. You know, uh, this is what what we have to have in mind to have this possibility to have uh, capabilities uh, interoperable. Thank you. I would say that uh, um, a resilience concept is an integral part of security concept. So uh, resilience grows together with uh, defense capabilities uh, being an integral part of the entire um, uh, security and defense endeavor. And as NATO says, uh, resilience acts as the first and last line of defense, meaning that uh, this ability uh, this national and collective uh, ability to resist and react to adverse uh, uh, environments uh, is now the, at the heart of the uh, collective security concept. Yes, um, any other question? If not, I think that we are close to the end of this panel, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for joining this panel early in this morning. And please join me uh, for a round of applauses for our great speakers today. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much for starting off today's debate with your uh, contribution to the panel on investments in security and defense. And thank you for the questions from the audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we take a 15-minute break. We reconvene here at 11.15, uh, uh, yes, uh, for the second panel of the day. Until then, there are refreshments available to your right-hand side in the room in... Uh